All right, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Mathieu, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, point cloud processing. Um, so it's getting pretty late in the day. Uh, I prepared for you an uh, interactive presentation. Interactive meaning I'm going to interact with my computer, but I'm happy to interact with you guys as well. So feel free to uh, you know, ask questions, uh, interrupt anything. Yes. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, we'll see when that happens. Um, so, uh, first of all, all that I'm going to do right now is actually live. Uh, it may fail. Let's hope it doesn't. Uh, but it's code that is available on GitHub at that address. Uh, there's also links on, on the FOSDEM webpage. Um, but I'm going to also update it uh, after the talk in case I change something in the code. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, just a few words about me. So actually, it's fun to be here because I got my PhD from this university a while back. So uh, yeah, fe I, I feel a bit at home. Um, and yeah, and now I'm uh, working uh, with Casper at the back and a and, uh, third person on Rock Estate. It's a small Brussels-based company, and we take open geo data and we uh, transform it into in order to make it um, uh, usable by uh, companies in the energy and uh, finance sector, uh, for example, to predict house prices or things like that. So, um, just so my personal uh, favorite software stack includes uh, these things uh, that uh, some of you have uh, encountered before. But this uh, thing that you're looking at is a Jupyter Notebook uh, on Python using, uh, installed using uh, Conda uh, as a package manager. All right, so let's start talking about uh, point clouds. So what are point clouds? Um, I'm going to, um, all right, here is, I need to tell you what, uh, where do they come from? They come, typically come from LiDAR uh, sensors on, well, for example, airborne ones. So what happens is you have a plane that uh, flies uh, above a certain area of land. They go back and forth, and they have this scanner uh, with a laser. It sends light towards the ground, and then it comes back, and it measures the time it takes to go back to the plane, and from that it infers for each point, an x, y, and z coordinate. So you really have, uh, for, for lots and lots of points, um, you, have, uh, yeah, you, you, have, you have this huge cloud of points in 3D above the ground. Um, and what's really nice uh, about, uh, well, it, it, it's really nice that uh, actually uh, the Flemish government, so, so yeah, the, there's, I mean, Belgium is complicated, but uh, at least in Flanders, they have uh, opened the raw data that they got from doing this exercise over the entire of Flanders and Brussels. So that means there's this huge 2.7 terabyte uh, of compressed data that's waiting for you to download and play with it. And that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, there's, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Um, so before I really start playing, here are a few things about uh, what, what, what you need to know uh, if you want to play with uh, LiDAR data. First of all, you're going to encounter typically two file formats, LAS, which is the standard file format with uh, certain specifications and uh, versioning thereof, and uh, LAZ, a compressed version of, of that. Uh, some uh, interesting software packages. So there's the Point Cloud library, which is um, uh, C++ based. And it's pretty powerful for many uh, standard things you may want to do with Point Clouds. Um, and yeah, so that's one. Uh, there's the Computational Geometry Algorithm Library. Uh, this is uh, more towards uh, academic uh, algorithms. Uh, it's really a lot of state-of-the-art 2D and 3D computational geometry things, not necessarily with point clouds, uh, but also a lot of mesh stuff, but also just 2D uh, things. 
that's also C++ based. And then there's our uh, favorite of the day, which is called PDAL. It's uh, kind of an analog. It, 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 uh, yeah, it's kind of an analog of GDAL, but for point cloud data. So uh, you have point cloud data, which is geo uh, yeah, geo coded, and you want to carry along this, and, and you want to to have a tool that does rob that, that robustly transforms your data in the way you want. Okay. And it actually has wrapped some uh, functionality from the first one from the point cloud library as well. Um, one uh, last one I wanted to mention, it's not open source, uh, but last tools is uh, something for Windows users that, that you know, want to try out uh, maybe some things. And, they, uh, and, and the, the, the primary guy working on that is also responsible for the last zip compression, decompression algorithm. Uh, which is open source. Okay, so let's start, get started now with some point clouds. So uh, I just yeah. So I have here this code. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, it's going to disappear as soon as I run it. So okay, let's get to the next cell. I'm going to uh, make sure that this last file is on my computer. In case it doesn't, it downloads it from the internet. So this code is going to run on your computer as well. Um, and I look at a map here. Uh, in case, well, maybe you recognize it, maybe you don't, but it's here. Um, so let me just gather a big uh, polygon. Let's take some forest as well. There we go. Uh, so we have a huge area, uh, including our building, which is here. Um, yeah, so... We take that, okay, same polygon. We have the coordinates now in the Belgian coordinate system. Um, and we, uh, so I, you didn't see the code, but there's this uh, code which actually calls P, the PDAL library, which really is going to take the, 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 the raw file I have, going to extract whatever is inside this polygon, and it's going to load that data in memory in Python. And so it tells me that I have about half a million points. Uh, that's about 4.5 points per square meter, which is not bad. Um, you can see a lot of details already. And I'm going to put this into some standard Python structures. Uh, don't worry uh, too much about it. What we want to see is more what it looks like. And what it looks like is like this. So actually, I have higher resolution than I expected. So let me put this like this. Um, OK, that's too much. Sorry about that. OK. So this is what it is. This is the point cloud we just extracted. Um, do you guys recognize uh, where we are? <laughs> so right, we don't see much. It's all red. Huh? It's OK, if we zoom in, we can see, yes, it's lots and lots and lots of little points. But uh, we don't see much. And the whole point uh, that I want to, to, to well, the whole exercise I want to do is to interpret this and, and, and uh, segment things and start seeing things. So first, I, first thing I can do is separate the ground from the rest. And this actually has already been done for me in the raw data set for, by the government. So they have this algorithm that detects what's ground, what's non-ground. And once I have the ground, I can actually remove the points and instead uh, turn it into a flat surface, which uh, I just do like this. Well, it's not exactly flat, but it's just a, yeah, it's a surface. Then I want to actually see what's more of a building type, what's more of a, a tree. And what the, what's the difference? Well. Points in trees, you have lots of points around. Points in buildings, it's really flat around. So what, what I, I'm going to compute some measure of how flat does the neighborhood of a given point look. And if I plot this as a color on the points, I can see it does already a pretty decent job at separating trees from buildings. And then I actually set a threshold on this number, and I really get a, a nice segmentation into two kind of points those that look like buildings, those that look like uh, trees. So let's hide the buildings for now. And let's try to actually figure out where the trees are, how many trees are there. 
Uh, how do we do this? Any ideas? <laughs> so what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to look for tree tops. I'm going to look at points that are higher than any other point around it. So I can do this uh, very quickly. And what I end up with is lots of points which are indeed, they, they are yeah, at the top of their, you know, they, they are local maximum, if you want, in this uh, point, of, uh, point of clouds that are trees. So uh, nice, I have the treetops. Then what? Well, I can, look, I can color the treetops in various colors. And then I can look at, for each point that is still green, what is the nearest color, uh, nearest treetop that is, that is that, you know, what's fine, it's nearest treetop. So I do that. Uh, it takes a bit of, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I actually, uh, they just have, uh, the, all of them have a different I, uh, uh, index. I mean, I, I just count the trees. They, they just go from one to 500. I just have only 10 colors, that's it. Uh, um, and, and so yeah, so actually I, I, I just look at the closest tree top and this kind of gives me a segmentation into different trees. So these are the trees that you can find around here if you go out. Um, and, uh, and then I can use the, those tree tops and change them to actually model the tree itself, not just the tree top. So let me do that. Um, I move those spheres around and they kind of get the size of what the tree uh, looks like. And then I hide the original points. I put back the buildings and I color the trees in green. And that's one first uh, idea of what, you know, we're, we're getting somewhere. We're seeing a much better picture of what's around us. Okay? Um, how am I, okay. I'm, I'm, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. This is, you, you can run this on your computer. It's going to do the same thing. I mean, this one has 8 gigs of RAM, I think, so it's not, it's not a power horse. Um, OK. So that's it. Any other questions about trees before I move on, uh, move on to? <laughs> um, OK, so it depends on, uh, I need to check the, the so PDAL was when I import, so I read in the data. It's doing that here. I don't think so. It's doing a big, actually a, bi a bunch of steps. So actually, first I cropped according to uh, the polygon that I drew on the map. Then I computed the height above the ground. So that's another algorithm, which assumes you already have a ground segmentation. And you compute the height of every point, uh, seeing what ground points you have around. Um, and then some eigenvalues and normal. I'm going to come back to that afterwards. But this is really something that measures something about the geometry of points around um, each point and whether it looks flat or whether it looks fluffy. Uh, so that's, uh, that's that. Okay. So, but I don't think it has used PCL, actually. Yeah. Do you model each tree as a sphere? Yeah, I mean, I could. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's, I mean, this is, this is just a toy fooling around. Uh, I could be most, m much more serious about it and use actually the, the points and, and, and cover them in, like, for example, a convex hull or something. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, it's already uh, interesting to see if I'm getting somewhere. Your analysis and calculations is mostly NumPy, SciPy? Yeah, it's mostly NumPy, Pandas, yeah. There's nothing uh, really special about this. And I, I have no hidden code except the, the part, and I can show you, it's uh, 10 lines, and so it wouldn't really fit below this uh, picture. But it's the part where I compute the local maxima uh, for the trees. Uh, but it's, again, it's all custom, uh, fairly straightforward code. Yes? So from experience, how many classes can you extract from the eigenvalues in the analysis building of the trees? But I can just look at every landscape. Right. You, I guess you can test to classify as many. Well, so we haven't, we haven't, I mean, it's, uh, it's not, it hasn't been our focus to classify as many different things as possible. For example, typically the next thing, I mean, of course you want to see buildings and trees. There's also lots of cars that you can see. Um, besides that, I'm not exactly sure, but, uh, but we'll see another interesting task, which is not segmentation. It's really uh, being a bit more serious than these spheres, uh, but for buildings. So let's do that. Uh, yep, building modeling. 
So, again, we're here. Um, and I'm going to pick this building, uh, the one that's just behind, maybe that one. Um, anyway, Philosophy Institute. Let's select this guy. Just going to take a bit of extra stuff as well. Uh, why not? And that's not supposed to be here. Okay. And we go ahead. So here's our polygon uh, with its coordinates. We run a PDAL pipeline. And again, um, so here I'm a bit cheating. Yeah, could I could just remove this. But I'm a bit cheating. I'm using uh, multiple LAS files, which I'm not providing in a download uh, at the beginning of the notebook. So I'm using more data than, I, than what I, uh, that, that you can find online, but y you're free to always ask. Uh, so why, what, what does it mean? Well, it means I have actually here a density of 28.9 points per square meter, uh, which is much higher than the four uh, per square meter that we had before. So um, there we go. We have loaded uh, whatever is above this polygon in memory. So let's have a look. Uh, again, I'm going to put this a bit wider. Okay, so uh, that is that building. Uh, maybe someone can confirm uh, by just looking uh, outside. I'm, I can't see from here, but anyway, maybe it's that. Maybe it's another one. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to make a 3D model of it. So make really surfaces uh, around that building. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm not even going to try to find a polygon on the ground. I'm just going to use the fact that seen from the top, this building is rectangular. And um, yes, and once I have figured out how to look at it from the side, then it's starting to get pretty easy because, well, I can look at 90 degrees from that and then I know the bounds on one direction. And if I look at this side, well, I can find the bounds in that direction, plus it's pretty easy to figure out the shape of the roof. So of course this building is pretty special, but I'm going to use those properties and build a model using that. So let's get started. I first, uh, so remember I talked to you about normals. So this is what I mean by normals. Um, here I drew the normals of every point. Uh, so it's really the direction that the points around it uh, look like so if it if it is a surface maybe it's not a surface but if it is a surface then it's really uh, how, where which direction is the surface pointing at every point so that's what the normal uh, filter is doing in pedal so you have lots and lots of such directions and let's for a moment forget where they are in space we just want to care about the direction itself so we forget where they are in space and put them on a sphere of directions and what you can see is most points or most normals are in a very specific arc in, on the sphere. Yeah, obviously this roof was like this, so most points are pointing always in this specific arc, not in every which direction. So this I can use now to basically infer, let me put those points back to where they were, infer the orientation of the building and basically figure out how I can rotate the building in order to align it with the axes. Is the no, this, this, is, this is inferred from the, from the row point cloud data by looking at the points around them. Right. Yeah. This is all PDAL. PDAL provides you with the normals, some eigenvalues to tell you if it's fluffy or flat. Uh, and yeah. So, so, I've, so you may have not noticed, but I've just rotated this thing. And notice how well aligned it's now with the box uh, around it. It's really aligned the, with the axes x, y, and z. So now I can really uh, go ahead with my plan of uh, you know, fitting a box around it and fitting a roof uh, as a surface. And so this is what I get, which fits uh, pretty neatly the point cloud that I ori originally had. So 
um, I need to rotate it back to its original coordinates. And as a nice um, cherry on top, I can go to the internet and fetch aerial images of, uh, of this area and put them on my model. So that's what I'm doing here. I put it on the ground, and I can also put it on the building. And I get that. So the building is supposed to look like that. All right. So that's, um, that is, that's that for building modeling. So any questions? Any more questions? No, no. Well, I know. I, I just, I just, I just, you know, I just fit. I just cut up my x axes into small bits, and then for each band, I look at what's the top high that I see here, and I'm just going to fit a, a surface using that. So it's a bit. I mean, it doesn't generalize well to to crazy buildings, but it works well for these kind of roofs. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, but then, then I, then I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I, I suppose after that, I, I do create a mesh with. Uh, once I have these points, I want to connect them with triangles and and, and build a, an actual surface. So I have a, a few more minutes. I just want to mention a few things to look out for in the future uh, about these very nice tools. So I have, I actually haven't mentioned. Uh, one of them, which is IPy volume, which is this thing which allows me to visualize this, change the change the, the the variables, and it actually updates the visualizations itself, which is extremely useful when you're developing the algorithm. So this interactivity is really key for us to be able to do these kind of things. Otherwise, we just wouldn't be able to see what we're doing. And um, so, yeah, IPy volume is a key player here as well. So on the PDAS side, uh, already now uh, they have, I'm not a core developer by any means, uh, by, uh, they already now they have implemented a custom uh, point in polygon algorithm in order to be, ex be able to extract very fast, huge amounts of points uh, given a, you know, a certain polygon using a, a well-known text representation. So that's very important because you typically handled uh, millions, billions of points, and then you need to go fast. Um, Apache Arrow support is an issue right now, and it would be uh, very interesting to have. And uh, personally, I'm working on Conda packaging this so as to make it easier for all of you guys to uh, work and, and play with this. Um, and Jupyter-wise, this is more uh, of a, you know, uh, personal uh, flavor kind of things. I'm pretty excited about the uh, ad advancement of new things in the realm of C++ Jupyter kernels, which uh, would be a nice interface to all these other libraries that I talked about in the beginning. Um, and making them interactive would be insanely uh, valuable. And then Jupyter Lab is this kind of uh, next, uh, next, uh, next phase interface as opposed to the notebook where presumably at some point you will be able to have the, the visualization on one side and then the code on the other. We can play around with the code and have the visualization however we want. So it's kind of a web-based IDE in a sense. Anyway, so that's it uh, for my talk. Thanks. No, uh, it's it's a, it, it's cheating. Yeah. Well, that's so that is true. That the, the data is super high quality, super high density. So that's that's really valuable. Not that not that I'm aware. I I, I haven't been involved in that, but I, as I can see, it's fairly raw data. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about any um, subsetting. I suppose I could. Well, I could show you as well. I mean, so so we we've, we we are busy as well, like building 
actual 3D models of, of buildings in Belgium. Um, we do have interesting demos on our website. Uh, so I guess I'll just show it because it's fun. Uh, here, demo. Anyone pick a, a city that they like? Kent. There we go. Sorry, they may have, they may have, but the thing is that this works for the whole of Flanders, and it's automated. So, so yeah, I mean, it's not uh, there's the, this. The, it's missing this thing here. There's uh, something sticking up, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's supposed to be working best for houses. So yeah. <laughs> Um, yes. IP volume, yeah. I, I, it's called. It's uh, it's written I P Y volume, in one word. Uh, just like I P I leaflet or I P I whatever is like the uh, live interactive version of uh, of something. Yeah, so, the, the, so there, there's really some work on that. I mean, this, this, this kind of uh, LiDAR data is definitely uh, useful for, uh, for, I mean, I'm no expert uh, by any means, but yeah, for, for, for these kind of either agriculture studies or really studying, uh, for, you know, uh, large bodies of forest. And this is actually, I think, probably the primary, the first use that there was of such technology was, you know, flying over Amazonia or whatever and finally figuring out what there does the, you know, I don't know, the, the tree cover look like, what kind of trees there are in that thing. No the data set was originally made for uh, hydrologic uh, ah, okay. the original, they sponsored it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Can I ask, so do you use, uh, can you explain something if there is a, if we need to denoise the point cloud yeah. to make uh, the surface uh, more flat because uh, during the process it can be. Right. So I don't exactly know about denoising. What I know is, OK, you can always subset your point cloud if it has enough density in the first place. Then you can always only take the points that actually look flat by looking at points around. That will actually help a lot. For example, we don't model chimneys here. The, the way we do it is we move, remove chimneys because they don't look flat. Uh, yeah. So, uh, th but but then if you if you really have a noisy and and shaky data set, I don't know what to do. Uh, I yeah I don't have a yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. yeah. I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> Maybe just one remark for those of you who have the printed program. There is one more presentation in this room. Um, so if you're interested, uh, it's called Mapping Fosdon. <laughs>